Okay. All right. So thank you for joining for a discussion of uh, introduction to women's imaging. Again, I'm Nicole Kurzbard Roach. Um, Dr. K, Dr. Roach, I have really answered anything. So Nicole, also fine. Um, so an overview, we'll go over breast imaging, um, important concepts regarding screening mammography, as well as diagnostic breast imaging and intervention. Uh, and then we'll touch on ultrasound specific to women's imaging, both gynecologic and obstetric. Uh, so breast cancer screening mammography um, was developed in the 1950s and trials of screening mammography established the mortality benefit in screened women um, in the 1960s and 70s. So this has been around pretty much as long as um, radiology has been practiced uh, on a national scale and international scale. Uh, screening women age 40 and older decreases breast cancer mortality by at least 30 to 40 percent. Um, and those are thought to be conservative estimates based on uh, women who are invited to screen and the number is probably much higher for women who actually undergo screening. The recommended screening interval does vary by organization, while the American College of Radiology recommends annual screening beginning at age 40. Um, there was a recent uh, United States Preventive Services Task Force recommendation, which downgraded the frequency of screening uh, to biennial, so every two years beginning at age 50, with a discussion with um, the patient and between the patient and her doctor about screening beginning at age 40. Uh, it depends where you practice and what uh, facility and insurance company you are dealing with, but generally radiologists will say screen every year and uh, internists or um, some other groups may be referring their patients to screen every two years. It's really a risk benefit um, discussion. The benefits of screening include, of course, early cancer detection. The earlier you detect it, the better the mortality is um, and the less morbid any treatment is, whereas the risks include uh, radiation exposure, the anxiety and any psychological effects of false positive callbacks, um, and the concept of overdiagnosis or catching and treating and removing a breast cancer that may not have actually contributed to someone's um, mortality. The number needed to screen um, ranges in different studies. Um, uh, recent suggests that um, you need to screen 84 women annually uh, between the age of 40 and 84 to prevent one death from breast cancer. So I'll go over briefly the breast imaging modalities. Um, there are a lot of ways to image the breast and um, we'll just briefly go through these so that you have an understanding of what breast imaging can include and then we'll focus on some cases. Uh, so mammography uses radiation. It is an x-ray to take a 2D image of the breast tissue. It's used for both screening and diagnostic evaluation. And the sensitivity or the ability to rule out cancer ranges anywhere from 50 to 85% depending on the density of the breast tissue. And we'll get into a discussion of uh, breast density in a little bit. Mammography is the best modality for evaluation of calcifications. Uh, calcifications can be either benign or associated with, uh, with pathology in the breast. Um, and 2D images are the best way to see those calcifications. Digital breast tomosynthesis um, is a newer technology. It in um, involves using multiple low-dose mammograms taken over an arc and then reconstructed as a 3D stack of images to scroll through the breast tissue. So you can see this looks like the mammogram on the prior page, but you can see the little scroll bar here going back and forth through the breast and the breast tissue um, is shifting ever so slightly so that you can see it at various projections. It's used for both screening and diagnostic evaluation. Um, it was just recently approved uh, by the FDA to be used alone, not um, in conjunction with a separate 2D image. And um, it has been shown to reduce the number of abnormal or false positive callbacks for things like overlapping breast tissue that you can see they unoverlap as you're scrolling through the breast. Can everyone hear me okay? Is my speed okay? Everything's going okay? Great, thank you. All right, here we go. Uh, so ultrasound. Ultrasound does not use any radiation. It uses sound waves. Uh, it's used both for diagnostic evaluation and biopsy, as well as for supplemental screening. Um, so used um, at some centers 
uh, to screen women, particularly who have dense breast tissue. And it has been shown to find more cancers in dense breasts, an additional three to four per thousand over the roughly two to seven per thousand that mammography finds. Um, but it also finds a lot of false positives. So an ultrasound, basically everything looks abnormal. Uh, so we have to um, include that risk as well in our consideration of whether or not to offer ultrasound, uh, screening ultrasound to patients. MRI also is a technique that uses um, magnetic resonance of protons, no radiation. It does use intravenous gadolinium contrast. Uh, it's used for both supplemental screening uh, for high-risk women whose lifetime risk is greater than 20% of developing breast cancer. And it has the highest sensitivity of any of the modalities, regardless of breast density, um, approaching 100%. If you have a negative MRI and it was a good study, you do not have breast cancer. Um, it is used in select patients. It's expensive. It is time-consuming. It is not without risk because you're injecting intravenous material. Uh, so it's um, not available to everyone for every indication. Molecular breast imaging is a newer technology as well. Um, it's done in conjunction with our nuclear medicine colleagues. A uh, radio tracer is injected intravenously. It is the, has the highest radiation dose um, because it, it's an intravenous injection of a radionuclide. So there is a whole body radiation dose, but it is um, pretty good at evaluating for abnormalities in the breast regardless of breast density. So this is another um, newer technique that's used at some centers for supplemental screening. And uh, you may hear about thermography. I didn't actually learn anything about it in medical school, residency, or fellowship, but I had a friend ask me about it. So once you are in practice, you will have friends ask you about all kinds of things, or you probably do now anyway. Um, so just to mention this, thermography uses infrared imaging of each breast during circulation of cooled air around the breast. While it was approved in the 80s by the FDA as an adjunct to mammography, it's not currently recommended by the Society of Breast Imaging, and I don't actually know of any academic or um, reputable community centers who use it, but I do know uh, patients who swear that their cancer was diagnosed by thermography and thermography only, so I just want you to be aware that this does exist, um, and people may ask you about it. Um, so now we'll delve into a little bit about what we're looking at when we're looking at the breast. So this is a schematic of the breast anatomy uh, from Medscape next to a regular um, 2D mammogram of the breast. Uh, both benign and malignant lesions can arise in the breast. Um, and we can see that we can see a lot of these structures, um, not the cellular detail certainly, and not the difference between ducts or lobules and um, the fibroglandular tissue is kind of lumped together here, but we can see skin, the structural Cooper's ligaments, which suspend the breast to the chest wall. We see the nipple. You can sometimes see some ducts or dilated ducts. We see the fibroglandular tissue. That's the uh, wider or denser areas on the mammogram. And then the surrounding fat is uh, dark or less dense. This is the pectoralis muscle. Um, and this is an axillary lymph node up here. So we see both cancer and benign lesions in the breast. Uh, sometimes we can tell them apart, sometimes we can't. We use uh, morphology and density and distribution of findings and certainly change over time to come to a recommendation and conclusion. So what does breast cancer screening actually entail? It's performed on asymptomatic women. That's why it's screening. If someone has a complaint, it becomes a diagnostic examination. You're no longer screening for something. There's limited data for screening men who are at risk. Uh, the UCSF Center of Excellence in Transgender Care has a pretty good schematic for when to screen certain men. And there's um, study uh, research ongoing about screening men with a family history of a BRCA mutation. But for now, most centers are only screening women. We do two standard mammographic views of each breast. The names of the views are craniocaudal and mediolateral oblique, and that actually refers, it describes the direction of the beam and how the breast is compressed. So craniocaudal from above and below, the breast is compressed between the paddle and the detector, and the beam comes from above, and mediolateral oblique, the breast is compressed in kind of a 45 degree angle toward the axilla, um, and the beam comes from medial and then across to lateral. 
Uh, important factors include both positioning, so the patient needs to understand, or the asymptomatic woman needs to understand that her breast is going to be compressed, it can be uncomfortable, it's a very short examination, the better she can hold still and the better compression she can tolerate, it will both improve detection of cancer, decrease the required radiation dose to penetrate the breast and get an adequate image, uh, reduce motion, and just provide a better examination. The radiation dose is higher than an x-ray but lower than a CT scan, um, or higher than a chest x-ray or a single view. Um, and it's regulated by the FDA, and actually all mammography is regulated by the FDA through the MQSA Act of 1992. There's a lot of specific instructions as to who can practice mammography, who can do certain types of biopsies, um, and regulations for uh, accreditation of breast imaging centers as well. <clears throat> so when we look at these standard mammography views, wherever you are, you know, I trained and I thought that there was only one way to hang images. You, know, you hang images when you put them on the pack station to look at them. Then I went somewhere else for fellowship and then somewhere else for my job. And I learned that everyone does things differently. So it's important to be flexible. But this is the way that I, if I get to choose, I want to look at a screening mammogram this way. Um, right is on the, you know, your left hand side, but that's radiology, right? And then left is over here. The, for the craniocaudal projections, the outer breast is always on top and then the inner breast is below. And then for the medial lateral oblique projection, you can see the pectoralis muscle here and the upper breast is here, the lower breast is here. And you can kind of see the nipple here as a guide. Um, upper and lower is easier to tell, but you know, if you forget, outer is always at the top of the screen for the cranial caudal. So diagnostic breast imaging is performed for anyone with a symptom. So either a palpable abnormality like a lump or focal thickening or someone recalled from a screening and it usually entails both mammogram and ultrasound. So indications include both a, um, a palpable lump, either palpated by the patient or by a clinician during an examination, focal pain, so one spot that is persistent, um, it's not cyclical pain, it's not diffuse pain throughout the entire breast, it's not musculoskeletal, um, and or spontaneous bloody or clear nipple discharge because that could be a sign of an abnormality in a duct. Items that should require, um, you know, a doctor to evaluate the patient but don't necessarily need targeted breast imaging with radiation and ultrasound um, include things like diffuse breast pain or a diffuse lumpy feeling or non-spontaneous milky or white or green or yellow nipple discharge that specifically occurs you know, only with nipple manipulation or after sex, those are, all these things are physiologic in one way or the other. Um, women with these symptoms, if they're of screening age, can certainly undergo screening, but these aren't necessarily indications for diagnostic imaging. And all of the above applies to men. Men also have breast complaints. They get diagnostic breast imaging. Their usual finding is gynecomastia, but breast cancer can occur in men, and so it's important to uh, take seriously any palpable lump or bloody discharge that they bring to um, your attention. Describing breast findings, this is important because a lot of people, um, it's very easy to get confused um, or to just say the wrong clock face and even breast imagers will do it occasionally. Um, so when you describe breast findings, you think about a clock on each breast when you're facing the patient. So if you're facing this patient, right is over here and left is over here. The outer breasts and the arms are over here. Um, and so 12 o'clock is 12 and six is six. It's the nines and threes that get confusing. So the outer breast is nine o'clock, but the inner, the outer right breast is nine o'clock. The inner left breast is nine o'clock. So we occasionally get recs for an, a mass in the, or a lump in the upper outer left breast at 10 o'clock then we're kind of stuck. We have to look at 10 o'clock, but we also need to look in the entire upper outer breast because the upper outer breast on the, on the left is 12 to three o'clock. Um, so the best that you can localize something, the better the communication is for everybody. Um, and distance from the nipple is best measured from the center of the nipple, not the areolar margin, because the areolar margin varies um, woman to woman or patient to patient. And it can be three centimeters, it can be five centimeters, it can be one centimeter from the center of the nipple. 
Um, so for standardization, it's from the center of the nipple. And ideally, any palpable lump or any abnormality in the patient's arm above the head, which replicates the positioning for ultrasound. Anyone have any questions so far? You won't be shy in asking them, right? Okay, so breast reporting, breast imaging reporting is very structured. Um, it follows the BIRADS or breast imaging reporting and data system that's uh, put out by the American College of Radiology. It's an evidence-based structured lexicon for describing pretty much any breast finding and making recommendations. And this is to avoid confusion and to standardize follow-up and to provide appropriate and evidence-based follow-up in a timely and consistent manner um, and again, basically to minimize confusion, diagnose the most breast cancer, and do the least amount of unnecessary biopsies on women. So um, breast reporting always starts with a statement on breast density. So this is where we talk about um, the various, there are four categories. So um, almost entirely fatty, and this is with the relationship of the amount of fat to the amount of fibroglandular, dense fibroglandular tissue. So you can see this breast, this is actually male breast, but it's, it's all fat. There's a, you can see the nipple here. Um, whereas the next category is scattered fibroglandular density. So you see mostly fat, but a little bit of tissue, but you can pretty much see through this tissue. A heterogeneously dense breast has even denser tissue. This fibroglandular tissue could obscure some masses in here and we may not be able to see them. And an extremely dense breast is essentially all fibroglandular tissue. There could be you know, a huge mass in here and we wouldn't be able to see it at all. This is important because the sensitivity of mammography decreases with breast density while the cancer risk also increases. So the relative risk um, for a woman with heterogeneously dense breasts of developing breast cancer compared to um, a woman with, with uh, scattered or fatty breasts is 1.2, and um, the relative risk is actually two for women with extremely dense breasts. So this is why the, um, some states have dense breast legislation where women have to get a specific uh, language in their letter that states that they have dense breasts and they should talk to their doctor about potential supplemental screening some states require insurance companies to pay for supplemental screening. Other states do not. Um, so that area is still in flux and research is ongoing. Um, but it's just important to know that there are different types of breast density. It does matter as far as sensitivity of mammography and risk of breast cancer. So here's our first case. This is a patient who came in with a palpable lump. And we see that there is a palpable lump because the technologist has helpfully placed a BB on the breast at the site of the palpable lump. So these are standard views. Again, here's the right breast over here, the left breast over here, craniocaudal and medial lateral oblique views, the outer breast, inner breast, upper breast, lower breast. So we can see, and the BB's right here. So we can see this is in the upper outer left breast. So we'll move on to some spot compression views. So when we do diagnostic imaging, we really cone in on the area of concern to see if there's anything there. And we can see maybe there's an obscured mass here and one back here. And if we look back here, we can see, oh yeah, there's probably a mass here and there's no symmetry on this side. Again, really nothing, maybe like a little lymph node here or something, but this is clearly the area of concern. So we go to ultrasound and then here it's plain as day. We see a you know, 1.7 centimeter irregular hypoechoic, meaning darker hypo, less echoic, fewer echoes um, relative to the surrounding breast tissue. Um, and so she went on to biopsy, which we'll, I'll talk about in just a second. Another case, this is a screening recall. Again, you can hang your images any way you like. Oh, go ahead. Not a question, right? Because someone doesn't know how to mute their computer? There we go. All right. Uh, so when we're hanging screening mammograms, you can hang them any way you like, but you will notice that this is this uh, patient's older images on the outside and the newer images on the inside. And you can see that there's this new area in the left breast that certainly was not there before and doesn't match the right. So that's concerning. She was called back. 
And she, the spots showed the exact same thing and she went to ultrasound and here is another irregular mass in the left breast. So now what do we do with these findings? We intervene. So we do um, breast imaging interventions for both tissue diagnosis as well as for preoperative localization. So this is an image of a preoperative needle localization. When you're in the operating room, if you're doing breast conserving surgery, basically all, most breast tissue feels the same, looks the same. You know, if there's an obvious palpable abnormality that can be taken out, but if something is very small or an early cancer, you may need um, some guidance and a needle wire or a radio frequency or magnetic seed. Um, they're all options for pre-surgical localization. This is an example of a needle localization with the tip and the distal wire basically at this site. Uh, you can use ultrasound, mammography, and MRI for interventions, and we'll briefly talk about ultrasound and mammography. So for ultrasound-guided intervention, uh, this can be performed for basically any lesion that can be reliably visualized with ultrasound. Um, it's easier for the patient. It's technically the least challenging um, type of biopsy, and um, it's much more comfortable for patients. It's real time, so you watch the needle the entire time, as opposed to some other uh, types of intervention. However, you can't biopsy with ultrasound something that you cannot see with ultrasound. And so that would include microcalcifications. You generally cannot see those with ultrasound. Um, and so therefore they need to be biopsied with mammographic guidance. And architectural distortion. So when we um, earlier talked about how ultrasound makes everything look abnormal, when you see a very subtle area of distortion on a mammogram, you can make that up anywhere in the breast with ultrasound. Um, so generally those do not go to ultrasound guided biopsy. A biopsy is usually performed um, with a core needle device and just local anesthetic lidocaine and lidocaine with epinephrine. You make a small incision in the skin to pass the needle without too much pushing. Um, and the needle is a kind of a cutting needle with a trough. It snaps forward. So here you see the needle lined up pre-biopsy and then it snaps forward to take a core through the top part of this lesion right here. It kind of snaps through right here. And when we're done, we always place a titanium marker to allow for both mammographic sonographic correlation and to facilitate any surgical localization if needed, especially if a patient undergoes um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the lesion shrinks to nothing. The only thing that's left is a titanium marker, which needs to come out. So this was that first case. You see this was the area in the left CC view that's been zoomed in. And we see this little titanium marker that's now right in that same spot. And then this was our second case. So here was that irregular mass. Here's the biopsy needle lined up and ready to go. Here it is traversing the lesion. And then here's that area of um, that spiculated mass. And here we see the clip right next to it. So mammographic and stereotactic intervention is for um, lesions that are only seen mammographically and that don't qualify for ultrasound guided biopsy. It uses mammography and fancy trigonometry with two mammographic views to position the needle within the breast. So here, you know, we see the patient actually lays down on the, what I like to call the worst massage table ever. So instead of your face going through the little hole in the table and having a nice day, your breast comes through the hole in the window, it gets compressed for 20 minutes, and someone puts a needle in it and takes some tissue out. Um, so the breast gets compressed into this five centimeter window and the machine swings back and forth to take some images to triangulate the appropriate depth into the breast. There are more safety considerations with stereotactic biopsy as opposed to ultrasound. When the breast is compressed, it has to be able to safely fit the needle within it. That generally means the breast can't be any thinner than two or three centimeters in full compressed thickness, uh, depending on the type of needle you're using. That means that some women won't qualify for stereotactic intervention if they have a thin breast or they're um, some sort of pectus or chest wall deformity where their breast just can't come through the window. And those patients may need to go to surgical excision rather than needle biopsy. And the patient also must be able to tolerate prolonged compression of the breast in a prone table, that you know, massage table or a sit-up table, but without having a vasovagal reaction. And you can discuss holding blood thinners if it's safe to do so. This is attending dependent uh, where I trained. They did not care where I'm working now. We certainly, it doesn't matter if you're on blood thinners, we will buy it to your breast anyway. Um, but some patients may prefer to hold them if it's a prophylactic 
um, baby aspirin or something, and that's something they should discuss with their doctor. Um, they will have an increased risk of bleeding if they're taking blood thinning medications, but it's not an absolute contraindication. So here we see, or you may or may able to not see if you squint at the screen, um, some little white specks of calcium inside this um, heterogeneously or perhaps extremely dense breast. Here they are when she's in compression in that little window. Um, and here is the needle positioned appropriately. We see the calcifications in the specimen that we've taken, and we see the clip here in the breast marked for um, future. This is very important if like a group of calcifications is this small, this clip may be the only thing that remains, and if the calcium was associated with abnormal cells, the surgeon needs to take them out. The only way to find them again is with that clip. So a summary of breast imaging, and then we'll move on to OBGYN and ultrasound. Briefly, screening mammography reduces breast cancer mortality. Um, supplemental modalities like ultrasound and MRI may be appropriate in certain subsets of at-risk women. And understanding the basic concepts of breast imaging and intervention is helpful to your patients or your friends or your family or anyone who has any questions for you because you're a doctor and people are going to ask you questions uh, whether or not you become a breast imager. Any questions about breasts before I move on to ultrasound? Great, thank you. Okay, so I'll talk briefly about gynecologic ultrasound and obstetric ultrasound just to do our complete whirlwind tour of an introduction to women's imaging. So GYN ultrasound, assessment of the uterus, adnexa, the ovaries and fallopian tubes, and the pelvic cul-de-sac. Um, indications include pelvic pain, including suspected ovarian torsion. Um, the number one indication or you know, referral reason for GYN ultrasound is usually abnormal postmenopausal uterine bleeding um, or a, a clinical mass on a, either clinical exam or some sort of um, other imaging exam, usually a CT performed for something else. And obstetric ultrasound, of course, is for assessment of pregnancy. This is an, exam an example of a late first trimester, early second trimester examination called the nuchal translucency examination. Um, it's part of a screening test for anomalies where you measure the nuchal translucency at the neck. So here's a case in a patient um, who had pelvic pain. In general, for uh, women of reproductive age and some women even not of reproductive age, a pelvic ultrasound is the modality of choice or the first imaging test of choice for someone with pelvic pain. You can see this patient is probably postmenopausal given the extent of her aortic atherosclerosis. Um, and you can see here, this is the a coronal uh, non-contrast CTCM. You can see the uterus here, the bladder here, the pelvis here, and then this low density mass. CT is not great and certainly non-contrast CT. Who knows what's in here? So she went to ultrasound and it shows this anechoic, meaning no echoes, thin walled lesion behind and kind of adjacent to the uterus, this is the uterus here, um, compatible with a right adnexal cyst. So follow-up recommendations for ovarian cysts depend on both patient age and cyst characteristics. There is a great Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound Consensus Statement um, from 2010, which talks about what cysts need to be followed and what cysts can be safely um, described as physiologic and move on, and this patient does not actually need any follow-up ultrasound. If something is going to be followed or evaluated more closely, that's surveillance imaging and that's specific to a finding. Um, but it's important to know that there's no actual current screening recommendation with ultrasound or with MRI for that matter for ovarian cancer for average risk, risk women. Um, so that is again another question you might get from your patients or friends or family members when they're going for their mammogram. Should they also be screening for ovarian cancer? And the answer for most people who are of average risk is no. Um, the blood tests aren't great. Ultrasound is not, you know, it will show you if something's there. If you have a negative ultrasound, that doesn't mean there's not some seed cancer developing and it's just not evidence-based at this time. Uh, here is another case of postmenopausal bleeding. So most postmenopausal bleeding is actually due to atrophy. The uterus and uh, pelvic organs are estrogen sensitive. Postmenopause, your estrogen levels go down, um, the cells become atrophic, and you can have um, vaginal spotting, and it's essentially physiologic. Um, but 
unknown until the endometrial thickness is assessed because postmenopausal bleeding um, is the uh, best sign of endometrial cancer. So the endometrium, this is a normal endometrium here on this cine sweep of a uterus in longitudinal plane. So we can see here the probe is in the anterior aspect of the vaginal fault. This is the uterine contour, this is the fundus, and this is the endometrial stripe, hyperechoic, meaning brighter echoes, um, very thin, normal. This patient came in and had postmenopausal bleeding, and you can actually see this basically two centimeter heterogeneous mass distending the endometrium. This is a similar plane. This is the uterine myometrium around here. This is the urinary bladder. <coughs> Excuse me. And she underwent a CT scan, and you can actually see this heterogeneous mass distending the endometrium here. If a postmenopausal woman comes in for ultrasound and her endometrial thickness is less than five millimeters, it's probably atrophy. She does not need to undergo a biopsy. If she's bleeding and her endometrial thickness is greater than five millimeters, she got herself an endometrial biopsy to exclude hyperplasia or malignancy. Um, but in a postmenopausal woman who is evaluated with ultrasound, for other reasons, the endometrial thickness can actually be up to anywhere between eight and 11 millimeters um, without requiring a biopsy. Here's another case of a young woman with pelvic pain. I believe she was scanned thinking this was a rule out appendicitis because she had right lower quadrant pain. Um, here on this coronal CT to orient you, this is liver, gallbladder, um, and the pelvis. And then we see this oval structure with a few circular structures around, um, around the periphery, a big low density thing, and the uterus down here. Uh, so we read this as an enlarged ovary with peripheral follicles, highly suspicious for torsion. Uh, so she underwent an ultrasound. This ovary, the right ovary here, because the right side is enlarged, five centimeters is too big for an ovary. There is, this is a color a power Doppler image. So power Doppler does not show the direction of flow, but it does show if there is flow and there is zero in this ovary. And then here is zoomed out transabdominal. This is all transabdominal image. Um, shows this big dilated structure, this cystic structure, this corresponds to this. This is the dilated fallopian tube. So this whole constellation of findings is compatible with ovarian torsion. This patient went to the operating room. They uh, were able to untwist and the ovary looked nice. So they saved it and they took out this huge dilated abnormal fallopian tube. So the most specific finding for ovarian torsion is um, size. So an ovary with compromised vascular flow will be edematous and enlarged, like this ovary five centimeter. Oop. Sorry. Five centimeters is too big for an ovary. If you think about it, when the vascular flow is compromised, venous flow can't go out, but arterial flow is probably still going in. That ovary is getting really edematous. There's nowhere for that flow and fluid to go. Um, in early torsion or torsion detorsion, an ovary may be a little bit edematous or um, may have still preserved blood flow. It's important to note that blood flow, unless it's absent, does not help you. So there can be flow in an ovary that is undergoing intermittent torsion or detorsion if her ovary was twisting and untwisting around this pedicle. Um, she's still at risk. It was probably doing that before she came in when it was fully fixed. Um, so the presence of flow does not exclude torsion, whereas the absence of flow is certainly concerning for ischemia or pending ischemia. And then moving on to obstetric ultrasound. Um, so most pregnancies are now evaluated with ultrasound several times, um, both early to establish the presence of a pregnancy, um, singleton versus multiple gestations, and to confirm uh, dates along with last menstrual period. A late first trimester screening examination might be performed to assess the nuchal translucency. And then most women undergo, if they don't get anything early, will certainly undergo a second trimester anatomy scan. And then additional scanning might be done in the late second or third trimester for growth monitoring or follow-up of any high-risk pregnancies. So early, the very first finding of an intrauterine pregnancy is a gestational sac. Um, as ultrasound gets better and better, we're seeing things earlier and earlier. Um, so an intrauterine fluid collection may be the only finding in a very, very early pregnancy. In the setting of a positive pregnancy test, if there is no adnexal mass to suggest an ectopic pregnancy, um, 
it's still most likely an intrauterine pregnancy, but it's not confirmed until a yolk sac is seen. A yolk sac confirms that any fluid collection is in fact a gestational sac. So by five weeks, gestational age, the gestational sac is present. By five and a half weeks, the yolk sac is present. And by six weeks, you've seen an embryo or an embryo is present. That is pretty standard development. Um, depending on how early it is in the six to seven week window, cardiac motion might not be seen. That does not mean that it's um, a non-viable pregnancy necessarily. However, if you don't see cardiac motion and there are certain criteria to follow for measurement of the embryo, um, you have not yet assessed the viability. That's important. So you don't want to say non-viable, but it's not necessarily viable either until you see the heart rate. But what if we do see a yolk sac, but no embryo or an embryo without a heartbeat? We there are specific follow-up recommendations. Again, our favorite, the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound have published some criteria. Um, it gives early pregnancies the benefit of the doubt. So generally a 10 or 13 day repeat ultrasound, depending on if a yolk sac is seen um, or if an embryo and a yolk sac are seen without a heartbeat um, to establish the viability of an early pregnancy. So what if the pregnancy test is positive and there's nothing in the uterus and there's nothing in the adnexa? That's a pregnancy of unknown location. This patient needs follow-up. She cannot just go home and assume she has a normal pregnancy. It could be a very early pregnancy, could be an early ectopic pregnancy, or it could be a missed failed pregnancy. Um, it's important to follow these patients with serial HCG. And then if there are changes that are concerning for ectopic pregnancy, like it goes up, but it doesn't go up appropriately. That could be an ectopic. She needs to be rescanned. If it goes up and it goes up appropriately, then great. Maybe it's a normal pregnancy. She also needs to be rescanned to confirm that. Um, so the ultrasound can be repeated in seven to ten days if it rises appropriately. If it rises inappropriately, um, suggesting an ectopic or if she has any symptoms, she certainly needs to be rescanned sooner. Um, here's an interesting case of a patient who came in. Um, this is the uterus here. We can see the hyperechoic endometrium outlined here, this kind of heart-shaped structure. And we see this embryo and gestational sac way out here. This is actually in the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube where it just comes into the uterus. This is essentially gynecologic emergency uh, because this is not in a normal pregnancy. It's not in the endometrium. It's ectopic. If it ruptures, there are, you can see all of these black spots here. Those are all blood vessels. Um, those can rupture and these patients can die. Uh, so in the hospital, they can die. So this is an ectopic pregnancy. She went to surgery and she did okay. And then moving on to the anatomy scan. This is usually performed between 18 and 20 weeks gestation. The organs are formed. The fetus is big enough so that we can see things, we can um, detect abnormalities and refer to follow up um, as needed. We follow a standard checklist from the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine to ensure we see all of the appropriate uh, findings. So here is a longitudinal view of a fetus in profile. We're looking for nasal bone, we're looking for the skull. Um, we see uh, probably the gallbladder here um, and some of the spine. So what can you see at um, your anatomy scan? You can potentially, hopefully with a good scan, um, see structural abnormalities. So for example, this is not an all-inclusive list by any means, but some of the more common things you can see in the brain are ventricular megaly. Here are the ventricles with choroid plexus. You can see this is actually an occipital cephalocele or an outpouching of uh, intracranial structures. Anencephaly or acrania. Um, earlier on this scan where you see the normal calvarium here. Here we see there is no normal calvarium. This is just brain tissue. Um, so this is abnormal, of course. Holoprosencephaly or failure of um, appropriate cleavage of the brain and midline structures. Um, here we see an example of a lobar holoprosencephaly with a big monoventricle here anteriorly. You can also see cleft lip, um, which suggests cleft palate. Cleft palate is much harder to diagnose. Um, we can see the heart to at least assess the presence of four chambers and a great vessel position. Most uh, patients who have a fetal cardiac or suspected cardiac abnormality or any other risk factors are going to go on to specific fetal echocardiography, um, but we can still suggest the need for that. 
In the abdomen, we can basically see anything that's sticking out or anything that is a big mass. So an omphalocele, of course, is a covered um, protrusion or extrusion of bowel and liver within the umbilical cord. Um, a gastroschisis is protrusion of bowel coming out of an abdominal wall defect, not associated with the cord. Here's an example of a sagittal clean fetus with some just loops of bowel out here flapping in the amniotic fluid. It's a gastroschisis. Um, and we can generally see an absent or a large multicystic dysplastic kidney. Um, so here's an example of a normal cross section of the abdomen. We can see the bowel is essentially unremarkable. Can't see a lot about the bowel unless it's really dilated. We cannot diagnose malrotation. We can't um, diagnose any sort of metabolic bowel problems. Um, we can say the bowel is there. Um, here are, we can see the kidneys very small. We see the collecting systems here. You can see if they are enlarged, you can sometimes see if there's a mass there. You are not going to be able to diagnose things like autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease that presents later. Of course, you may be able to suggest autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease if the kidneys are very large and very echogenic. Um, but if the kidneys are functioning okay, you are going to see um, normal amniotic fluid and non-dilated collecting systems, um, but unless there is a structural abnormality, you are not going to see that. The limbs, we look for all four limbs to make sure they are present and not fused, um, but again, metabolic abnormalities, unless there are a lot of fractures in a patient with osteogenesis imperfecta, we may not be able to diagnose um, all metabolic bony abnormalities. Um, so in summary, pelvic ultrasound is the examination of choice for most pelvic complaints in most women. Uh, some women will undergo CT and then be referred to pelvic ultrasound, but it's going to be the best assessment of the uterus and ovaries um, as an initial step at least. And ultrasound is useful in evaluating all stages of pregnancy from early confirmation to third trimester growth. So here are my references. Again, my favorites on this slide are the management of asymptomatic ovarian cysts for follow-up and the diagnostic criteria for non-viable pregnancy. Um, these are things I use basically every time I'm interpreting ultrasound, I make a recommendation based on these. So thank you so much. This is my current email. I should say I work at Kaiser Permanente Baldwin Park. Um, when I get my UCR email, I will have my own Zoom account, and then you can email me at my UCR email as well. Um, but does anyone have any questions, anything you would like me to go over again, any immediate feedback? Oh, thanks, guys. All right, well, if you have any questions, oh, that's so nice, thanks, wonderful. Did you guys learn something? Now you're spoiling me. Great. So any questions, feel free to email me um, or email Dr. Tan and get in touch with me. I'll ask her about your question. Um, and best of luck with everything. If you have any questions about radiology, breast imaging, anything in general, feel free to reach out. Um, and have a very happy and safe Halloween. Oh yeah, the X topic is cool. It's terrifying, but cool. All right, thanks guys. Mm-hmm.